Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love.
share it, to experience it, to participate in it. And the way in which Scripture speaks to know someone is to love them. And to know God is to love God. Because as Scripture also teaches, God is pure love. His divine love is the source and the ending of all human love. And what that, what that means is that your love is, is really a gift from God to each of you to express to one another. And it also means that that love ultimately draws you back into relationship, a deeper relationship with God. His divine love is the source of your love for each other and the purpose of your love. It's to express that ultimate love God has for you. As much as two people may love each other, we know that as broken and fallen people, our love is always imperfect. But as imperfect as it may be, it always has this going for it. It points us back to God. God who is the source of perfect love. It nurtures in us a longing for God so that as you know and love each other more deeply, you also grow to know and love God more deeply. It's interesting that in Greek, the language the New Testament was originally written in, there are three different words for love. The first is a love, a romantic kind of love that a man and woman share. And then there's another specific word for love that's shared between family and friends. And a third specific word for love that is only applied to God. But it's interesting that in both of these passages, that word agape, the word love that God has for us, is applied to the love we share among ourselves, between each other. It's interesting here that the word is, that's used to talk about love in these passages is not a word for romantic love, but the word for divine love. Reminder that God's love is the foundation and the center of our love for each other. That divine love that God desires to express through your love for each other is most clearly seen in the sending of His Son, Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that your wedding, Laura and Matt, will become a reflection and a celebration of God's love. And that by making divine love the foundation of your marriage, your new home, your new family, that what God will do through you is express His love and make you more like Christ, who is the fullness of love. The kind of love that we're called to express is hard work. Often. It is love with flesh on Both of those passages Colossians and 1 Corinthians speak about a love that's tangible. You can, you can put your hands on it. You can see it. It's love that's patient and kind, not easily angered. It's love that forgives, love that hopes for the best, expects the best of another person. That's not love that is for the faint-hearted. It requires commitment and sacrifice. That sort of love wasn't easy for God, and it certainly isn't easy for us. But in the end, it is worth the effort. Because in the end, it is a kind of love, as we read a moment ago. A love that will never give up. A love that will never fail. A love that will get you through the good times and the bad times. The purpose of marriage is for each of you, and for you together, to express God's love and to experience it, and also through the, your, so that through your expression and experience of God's love, you may be made more like Christ, so that at the end of your lives, you can honestly say, Laura, I'm a better person, a more loving person, I'm more like Jesus Christ, more what God desired for me to be because I was married to Matt, and so that Matt, you may say, I'm a better person, a more loving person gracious person, more like Jesus Christ, because I was married to the Lord. I encourage you both to look back on this day often and with fondness 